the first major applications of PLS, at least in the chemical engineering industry, was for this for this very important problem of salt sensing. Because it is such a critical problem that many companies face, it's a natural very first application to look at using PLS. So what we have in many processes, we have final quality measurements, so even intermediate measurements in a, in a very complex flow sheet with many steps, there may be some certain checkpoints or certain variables that are really important to us. And those measurements or those properties are expensive to measure in the lab, or if by the time we take a sample and we get the map value back from the lab, a long time has passed and the process has actually shifted and moved on quite a bit. Okay. So what the aim is here for a soft sensor is can we get a prediction of that measurement that's really hard to measure, expensive or time consuming? Can we get that measurement quickly and cheaply using other data in the process? So one way we could do that without resorting to PLS or any regression model, in fact, is to use a first principles model where we take the theoretical model, say the reactions, the heat transfer, the mass transfer equations that define that system, and we, we use those equations. So those equations come from cause and effect or from journal publications or textbooks. And we use those very complex equations in many cases to derive a prediction for this property of interest. Okay, so <coughs> one, a classical example that I'll talk about here in a minute is the vapor pressure in the distillation column. The vapor pressure in the distillation column is known to be related to the Antoine equation, which is a function of temperature and pressure in the distillation column. So we could go use the temperature and pressure in the distillation column to predict the vapor pressure. And that is, that is in fact used in, in the petrochemical industry very widely. But some models are, are very difficult to, to do that way, right? So the Antoine equation is a very easy case study. Uh, case, it's a very simple equation. But many times, the coefficients that go into this first principles model, let's say a heat transfer coefficient from a heat exchanger, or the reaction rate constant in a, in a reactor or bioreactor, just to get that value is extremely expensive and time consuming. You have to do experiments on the process, do parameter estimation, and you may not have the opportunity to actually even do that in, in practice because you're going to cause all spec product while you do that experiment. Or it may just be too costly to do it, or sometimes impossible. The other problem we sometimes face with these very high fidelity models, especially those that are related to PDEs, so we use a very high fidelity partial differential equation description of the process to model let's say heat transfer from the regular shape body, or um, some of the other equations that we use are these uh, finite element models of, of reactors. Those models can take a really long time to execute. And so to be able to get a prediction from that model in a, in a real time is, is impossible. Okay. So sure, we could go the first principles route, but there's a lot of work involved and it may not it may not even work out at the end. If, we, if you do have this opportunity though, it's actually quite powerful because then you can use that first principles model later on to optimize your process and, and make improvements. Because that is a cause and effect model. You know that if I adjust the inputs to that model, I am going to see the output change. But what we're going to look at today is really just a black box. Can I put in inputs? And we've got some black box empirical model here and get our output y hat. Okay, so we're just going to take measurements from our process, whatever we have available, and use as inputs here in this empirical model to get this prediction y hat. And you could use a variety of empirical models to do this. You could use a common filter, neural networks, least squares, PLS, there's, there's a variety of tools that one can use in this empirical model. Do you have a question? Um, so the principle for a soft sensor or an inferential sensor is to use any form of predictive model, it doesn't matter which type, to predict this Y, given 
the, the measurable data in X. Okay. Now, we'll, we'll look at PLS in today's class, but you could, like I said, use any particular predictive model. It doesn't have to be PLS. And when you get this Y hat, we're now able to monitor the process based on the prediction of Y. We don't have to wait for the lab value to become available, say, eight or 10 hours later. On some processes that I've seen, that lab value can take a week or two weeks before you get it back. So by then, everything has changed in your process. You can't, you can't go make adjustments to try and fix your process if that Y was wrong. You've already, you've already passed that opportunity. But if you can get this prediction of Y in real time or very close to real time, you've got an opportunity of fixing any problems in your process. Or you can even use it for feedback control. So you can use that prediction of Y and maybe adjust the one or more of these input X's to maintain that Y at target and you can use a feedback control structure, a cascade loop or a PI loop or whatever it is. Okay. So that's what we, we want from this. <coughs> we really want to get here to this Y hat in, in, in a much faster way and a much cheaper way than, than we would normally have to get it. And we should, this value of interest y should ideally be coming from the process. I'll talk a bit about simulated data afterwards. It's not entirely appropriate to use a simulation to build your soft sensor. Although for a course project that's perfectly adequate because we've got no other, we don't have a little petroleum refinery available to us yet. So please use simulations instead. But in general, you shouldn't try to build what this, the soft sensor is from a simulation. Even from something like Aspen, there's fairly high fidelity or G pond, you're not going to get the soft sensor model that you can just take from your app simulation and apply it online. But we'll talk about that later on. The sort of inputs that go in here are anything that's available, anything that you can use to get a good prediction of Y. So real-time measurements from the process. You can even do calculations on these process data and add them in as new columns over here. So remember I said up here, we don't, first principles models can have some drawbacks. But let's say you do even have a halfway decent first principles model that's kind of a good approximation. You can put that in as an input column in your X space, even though it's not going to be as, as good as, as, a, as a first principles model on its own. You can at least help PLS along by putting in a column that has some of those calculated variables in. Spectral data, acoustical data, I'll talk about that in a later class. Um, so sound or vibration data. Image data, categorical variables, yes, no. Who is the operator on duty? Is it Ron or is it Harry? Because you know that when Ron is there, he operates the process differently to Harry. Um, those categorical variables can be used. Basically, anything that's available to boost your prediction of Y is fair game to go as input. as long as those inputs are going to be cheaply and easily available as well. Of course, otherwise you're going to just negate the whole purpose of building the soft sensor. Okay, so let me just give an example here. This was one case I was lucky enough to work on just after I finished up here at Mac. I, I worked in MACC for a while, and this project was one of the projects I worked on with Petro Canada um, out here. But they, that plant has since closed down now. But what they were doing there is they were trying to predict this vapor pressure, the reflux <coughs> pressure, from the bottom of the column. And available to them was, I think there's about 30 odd variables available. And this, this data set is on, on the website. And it's one of the ones that you downloaded today. I don't know if we'll get a chance to look at it, but if we do, that's great. But if we don't, what, what was going in there was there's pressure variables, temperature variables, there's flow rates through the column, and a lot of temperature variables available. Now, just some background. What PetroCanada was doing is that they were using this vapor pressure value down here. That vapor pressure was their critical control variable. This, is, this product, that was coming out the bottom is what they were selling to their customers. And they needed to keep that vapor pressure on target within a certain range. And that target changed depending on the time of year. But that is their control variable. And they, in fact, 
had that under feedback control. So how would they have that under feedback control if they're only getting a lab value and it's taking eight hours to, to get the lab value? Like how were they doing feedback control in this process? What they were doing is they were using the Antoine equation that I spoke about earlier. And the Antoine equation, if you look it up in the textbook, there's different forms for it, but one particular structure is it uses the log of pressure, multiplies it by a coefficient B here, C is another coefficient, and T is a temperature. So <coughs> you can predict the RVP using the pressure from the column and the temperature from the column. And these coefficients B and C, they determined on their process. So they used a whole bunch of previous data. They had their lab values from, for RVP. They looked up at the corresponding time they took that RVP sample, what the pressure in the column was, what the temperature in the column was. And they used nonlinear regression to fit the values for B and C. So now we've got rough values for B and C. We can go plug those in and get a prediction for RVP. So they go do that, but then when they go measure their RVP in the lab, there, there's an offset. Right? So they get their RVP predicted, and then they get RVP lab. <coughs> and there's some residual error there. So let's say that that error is, is given by RVP hat minus lab. What they go and do is they calculate a bias, which then goes, the bias is basically RVP lab minus RVP hat from the previous time that they got the lab value. So that what they go do is in the future, they go calculate the, they get the pressure on the process, the temperature on the process, they plug in this term over here, and then that bias just corrects the first principles model just to get it close to the lab value. Okay? So at the time that they get the lab value sample and they've updated this bias, this equation is accurate. But then some time proceeds and then the equation's predictions start to drift away from the real values. And then three times a week, so Monday, come Wednesday, they take another sample, get the lab value, recompute the bias, so this bias term in the equation changes three times per week to keep the equation on track, basically. Because the prediction isn't quite, it's getting them in the ballpark, but it needs to be refined a little bit. So that's a standard technique. You'll see that many companies use this bias update scheme. Okay. Now, this might be a little hard to see. I hope it's clear in your notes in here. What was happening is that sometimes that RVP prediction, which is the line in red. So that's the Antoine equation prediction in red. Was, was very far off. The black circles, which are unfortunately not that big here, are the, the values measured from the laboratory. And you can see here, particularly there's a period of time where here's the lab value in black and black. Here's the lab value in black. And you can see here's a whole deviation with the predicted value in the red line. What was going on there is that the temperature controller, uh, the temperature input to the Antoine equation was, was off, right? So obviously the prediction from the Antoine equation also just goes, goes right off. And as a result of that, they have that in the feedback control, things change in the column, okay? So they were experiencing these problems with the Antoine equation prediction. And it also required this, this, uh, this bias update, which is a little bit clumsy to do because an operator has to go take a sample, they have to go line it up with the data. And it's, a, it's a messy and time consuming process. What they were hoping for then is to be able to use PLS to get the predictions and then never have to do this bias update. Okay, so again, in blue are shown the predictions from the PLS model, which a little closer to the RVP values. Um, overall, the standard error from PLS was lower than the Antoine equation predictions. And you can see though, some interesting periods of time, you see how the blue line goes missing here for a period of time, and over here as well. That was when T squared and SPE were high from the PLS model. So we really weren't, the PLS model wasn't able to make 
a prediction. So the blue line kind of disappears for some of those periods of time. Okay, so that's that's why we get these <coughs> periods of missing. So here's the lab value over here. It corresponds that we don't actually have a prediction for the PLS model. We do really, I mean, you can always force the PLS model to give you the prediction, but I've chosen to hide it here when SPV and T squared is high. So this particular uh, PLS model was able to successfully operate on a process without using the bias update scheme. And at the end of it, I think there were about 28 variables used in the model. So rather than just temperature and pressure, the two variables from the Antoine equation, there's now 28 variables from the PLS model that go in. So I'll talk a bit more about that later on. There was actually a problem with the PLS model that needed to be fixed. And uh, that could also be a good research project. I have the data available. So if anyone wants to work on this for a research project, you can easily get this data and use it. So that's one, one example that was, was able, and they were able to implement this, by the way, in real time. In their, in their uh, control system, they can put the equations for PLS in there, and it was working under feedback control for, for some time. <coughs> Another example of a soft sensor, you'll see this case study again later on when we look at, at image data. Um, I worked with Hong Lu, she and I worked together for, for some time. Where we, where she, well, she did this work as part of a thesis, and I did the online implementation uh, coding for this. What what she did was develop a soft sensor to predict the seasonal from snack food. Okay. So here's Doritos, and this is unseasoned Doritos, and this is over over seasoned Doritos. It's, it's probably not so clear in these images. And this is one of uh, Frito Lay's other products. This is unseasoned, and then this is too much seasoning. And just about right seasoning is here in the center. Okay. So the current approach for measure, measuring seasoning is that an operator goes to the line and grabs a sample and takes it to the lab. They don't eat it. They take it to the lab <laughs> and they dissolve the sample and they measure the salt content. Okay? Because the seasoning is uh, applied to the snack food as one package, right? So they take this the seasoning, which has a known salt content, so let's say 5% salt, and they apply it to the snack food. So when they measure this, the salt content in the lab, it's a surrogate for the seasoning, and assuming the seasoning and the salt are well mixed, which they are. Okay, so that, that process is again time consuming, and this is a very high volume production line. So if there is a period of time when they get their lab value and they say, well, hang on, there was we were over seasoning or under seasoning for this period of time, they have to go scrap that new product. If you can predict the seasoning value in real time from this camera image, which you can, we got it down to being able to predict at five predictions per second from just a standard video camera. You can you can get feedback control on that seasoning and then adjust the upstream unit that's that's responsible for applying the seasoning to the food to keep it at constant level. Okay. So I make it sound a lot simpler than it is, but like I said, we'll, we'll actually go through this uh, case study in a section of image analysis, which will be next week when we can't. So the way they implement it online is you've got cameras, you've got good lighting over here, you measure your image, take it to the computer, which then does the calculations and gets your prediction of seasoning. And this, uh, there's a, then there's feedback control to the unit that applies the seasoning to the to the snack group, so that you basically got a feedback loop now for seasoning as your as your So you've got a soft sensor for seasoning. And what was really interesting with this case study is when they applied it online, they noticed tremendous oscillations actually in their in their seasoning being applied. So previously they sampled. Let's say once every hour, someone took an, op uh, an operator took a sample and sent it to the lab. But when they started to apply it in, at a very fast sample rate, they actually noticed these oscillations in, in the seasoning being applied. So some customers were getting under-seasoned product, other customers were getting over-seasoned product. Because if there's an oscillation in the process, and you're taking a sample over here, over here, over there, you're never really seeing that this is in, inside the process, right? 
right? You just, it's the, the whole night was here, right? But the moment you, you sample at a faster rate, you can now pick up that this is going on. And what was happening is that there was the seasoning uh, device that was applying the seasoning was emptying out. And as it gets empty, the amount of seasoning applied is less and less. And then the hopper gets refilled, and so now there's a lot of pressure on that hopper, and so every time it shakes seasoning out, there's more seasoning than normal going out. So, so they were under applying and then over applying. As the hopper was re being refilled, and they were over applying, and as the hopper emptied out, they were under applying seasoning. So they fixed up that problem based on getting this soft sensor value for the seasoning. <coughs> Now we also did work with them on being able to predict the crispiness of snack food. Being able to predict how crunchy the snack food is when you put it in your mouth. And we got kind of okay predictions from just an image, which is surprising that you can predict roughly how, how crunchy it's going to feel here in your jaw. Like all those vibrations when you bite into Doritos, it's got that satisfying crunch. <laughs> Not like a cardboard or a piece of bread. It's a different different set of vibrations that go on in your jaw when you crunch them. And there's a just there's a just right crunchiness that's measured by trained professionals whose job it is to know what just the right crunch is. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's a great job. <laughs> so um, so yeah, you, that, that's a very difficult to measure why variable crunchiness. They they aren't there is a there is a device on the market that will slice through a chip and measure the vibrations as that slicer cuts through the chip. But again, you have to take a manual sample for line to the lab and measure that. And then if the crunchiness is just, it's all, if you need to adjust your oil temperature and, and the other settings in the process to get the crunchiness just right. <coughs> and then you don't want to overcompensate and then undercompensate. So you need, it, ideally, it would be great to have feedback control for these organoleptic properties, uh, organoleptic being how, how the product feels in your mouth. So the final example is uh, this one here where this data set's available for you. You can just go download it from this company's website. It was a series of, of 80 rows in the database, 80 observations, where they took a near-infrared sample of corn. And there's four Y properties of interest, moisture, starch, uh, oil, and protein. And just using those near infrared spectra as your X data, you're able to predict what these four Y properties are to within reasonable accuracy. So the root mean squared error for, for all of these is pretty low, and this is reported with five components here to observe this series. So again, this would be great to apply online because you can then measure the properties of your corn as, as it's coming in. You could, if you needed to run a process where you know you needed corn with a certain moisture, as the input to the process, you could have your process line and the input, and you have a near infrared probe just looking at the input <coughs> screen over here, predicting what the value of moisture is. And let's say there's a certain cutoff. You don't want moisture below 10. We could just have a diverter on the line that will divert material with low moisture off to a different process, or just not process it at all, and then let the high moisture material through, or whatever your objective is. Maybe it's not moisture, maybe it's starch or protein if you're making bread, you want a particular protein in your input. And many companies use this to, um, when they're buying product on the market, they want to be able to know what sort of product they're buying. So they build this calibration model and then test their raw materials before they process them, just to make sure that they're, they're within the specifications. So that's a quick and easy way without having to go through the usual laboratory value uh, routine of measuring these quantities, which can take maybe several days before you get so near infrared is actually now very common in most processes. Uh, you can buy for for very cheaply, i.e. under fifty thousand dollars, uh, a sensor that measures near infrared in the process, and have that right in line. So uh, it's very common to see this in in pharmaceutical companies now. They'll have a near infrared probe on their pipes, and it measures the near infrared spectrum of the material passing through the pipe. Uh, just related to that model, here's another example of the coefficient plot. Because there's five components in this model, 
and our x variable are spectral wavelengths, uh, are spectral over these wavelength range. The coefficient plot is itself a spectrum. It's showing you how much the different parts of the spectrum contribute to predicting the y variable. So here in red, for example, is the spectrum for protein. It's showing you that you can get high protein values are due to higher spectral values at the 2200 wavelength range. And lower protein values are due to higher spectral values at the, at, the, at the end here of the spectrum. Okay, so you can actually interpret your coefficient plot in the same way as the original spectrum. In fact, you can even show your loadings plot in this way. Your loadings plot, W1, is also itself a spectrum. It's the weight across the different wavelengths. It's actually quite interesting to note here how oppositely correlated the coefficient is for protein and starch. Which makes sense. A, a, a kernel of corn with high protein content has low starch content. Okay. So, so that's, that's an interesting observation. Okay, so before it, we're going to build a, your own calibration model in a minute on uh, wood samples from the infrared spectrum. But before we get there, just to quickly summarize some advantages <coughs> of, of soft sensors. The reason why they work so well is because we get our X data far more frequently than we get our Y data. That's, that's clear. The other thing that may not be quite uh, obvious at first is that our X data often has much greater accuracy than the Y value. Think about the crispiness. If I have someone in my lab whose job it is to tell me the crispiness value, they're going to be, there's going to be high variability in their, in their crispy value if it's a taste pan. Or sometimes some of the lab values, let's say even this vapor pressure, the laboratory equipment <coughs> to predict vapor pressure has a fair amount of error in it. But the temperature variable and the pressure variable that goes into that predictive model, we can measure temperature with a couple within 0.1 degree accuracy, and pressure can be measured uh, within a few Pascal of accuracy quite readily with commercial thermocouples and pressure sensors. So we can get our X data at greater accuracy than, than the lab value. It doesn't mean that you're going to predict with less error than the lab value. That would be impossible. But it means at least your inputs going in are going to be fairly, fairly accurate. The other nice thing if you use PLS is you get a free check for consistency on SPET squared before you make a prediction. You can handle missing values with PLS and collinearity. So if you had very highly collinear variables that may that will cause a problem with least squares and other some other tools, but POS handles that collinearity in the space. Uh, all these tools, with the exception of PLS, they give you very clearly defined confidence intervals for your prediction. PLS has a confidence interval equation, but it's not there's there's some theoretical issues related to that. But it, it is possible to get uh, so a y hat plus or minus a certain value. So the software generally does not give this to you, but they, I, we will look at an equation for that later on. So that would be nice as well. You don't just want to tell the operators, uh, this is my prediction. It's nice to have an error down for them as well. Okay. Now the other thing to remember is we don't usually get rid of the laboratory that gives us our y values. Okay, so it's clear we need a laboratory initially to get our Ys and our X data so we can build our inferential sensing model. But then once we've got that model, we usually do not give up the tool or the equipment that gets us those Y values. What we do though is we use it less frequently so we can save on costs, but we still use the lab value to double check our results. In the future. So in the future, yes, I get my white hat for my soft sensor, but I still want to check it every so often with my laboratory to make sure I'm still on track. Because how do we ever know when our soft sensor is, is, is failing? Right? We might see SPE go up, we might see T squared go up, but we're going to need to rebuild our model maybe in the future. So two, three years from now, things have changed on our process. We might need to rebuild our soft sensor you're going to need the y values and the x values to do that. So it's helpful to keep the original tool that gives you those y values around so that you can rebuild in the future. So soft sensors are not a build once you put it online and you walk away from it. 
there's some maintenance that you have to do, okay? We'll talk about the maintenance aspect, and that's a critical part that people don't often touch on in these courses. We'll talk about maintenance of these multivariate models in a future class. We'll get to that. <coughs> so don't get rid of your lab. Okay? Now, you might hear the term calibration sometimes instead of soft sensors. To me, calibration is when you're doing calibration, you're you're getting your samples, your X matrix, your Y matrix to build the model intentionally. You're actually going and, and taking samples, you're measuring things to get your data to build the model. To me, a soft sensor is more, I happen to have this data in my database, I go to it and I build this predictive model. I, I don't acquire this data with the purpose of building a soft sensor model. So that's the subtle distinction I see with calibrations. You can actually go out with the intention of building the model and to acquire the data for a model. And so very often calibration developed soft sensors are far more accurate than this. And because they actually go do a design experiment and vary the data to get good variability in the, in the data set in your X and your Y matrix to build your soft sensor. Where if I just happen to go to my database, that data was never acquired with the intention of building a soft sensor. So it may not cover the full range of process operation. Or there may be problems with that historical data. We'll talk a bit more about it towards the end of this section. That prevent my predictions to be um, really good. Whereas my calibration predictions, you almost get super high R squares and very low root mean square errors because they've intentionally designed the way they get their data. Okay, so two phases. There's a model building phase, there's a model testing phase. It's the same idea as process monitoring. And we saw this last class. Um, how do we judge if our model is any good? <coughs> well, there's three, three things we look at. One is the root mean squared error of estimation, which is really just the average error. So y minus y hat divided by n. So that's the average error squared and then I take the square root afterwards to, to get the, my units back when I build the model. Okay. Root mean squared error of prediction is exactly the same thing, but that's calculated on totally new testing data. And then root mean squared error of prediction will almost always be greater than root mean squared error of estimation. I, in very few cases, I've actually seen them being smaller, but that's just by luck. But mostly, you'll always see a root mean square error of prediction is greater than your square error of estimation. That's right. That's to, to be expected. The other thing that you should track, and, and most people don't tend to do this, is your average offset. So calculate your y minus y hat. That's your error. And then just calculate the average error. That number should be close to zero. Okay. So if you've got a biased predictor, you're always, you've got some constant offset there. But many people don't check the bias. You want small bias and you want small average error. Okay? And so the way that this is often illustrated is it's the same idea as precision and accuracy, right? You've all done that lab, your lab report where you had to differentiate between precision and accuracy, right? So, so if there's no good having my predictions all up here. This has got high, low precision or low accuracy? Precision. <laughs> low precision? Low accuracy. Okay, so you've got high precision <coughs> and low accuracy. Yeah. Okay. Accuracy. Okay, so now that this is biased, to me that's biased. You want, uh, you want, you've got a, a high. Sorry, you've got high precision, yeah, you've got good, you've got good root mean squared error. In other words, your root mean squared error is small, but your bias is big. You're, you're, you want to be ideally right there in the center if you've got a large bias. Okay, so ideal cases over here, where you've got small bias and you've got small root mean squared error. The nice thing is about all these three numbers, they're in the original unit of the y variable, which that's one thing over R squared. R squared it can be a bit misleading. <coughs> These three metrics are all in the original unit, so it's very easy to communicate with people about it. Okay, so here's the part where we look at the cross-validation and how to judge the soft sense model. 
The ideal case for soft senses is as follows. You build your predictive model, and you have a completely separate test set. Okay. And on that test set, you measure the, the prediction error. Right? So you, minim, you want minimum root mean squared error of prediction, and you want the smallest bias possible on that test set. And so if this error is too high on your test set, you go back and you rebuild your model. Maybe you go change your pre-processing. We'll talk about uh, some different pre-processing steps later on. You maybe include other variables that you, you thought were not going to be useful to you. You now go bring them in. And then you go back to your testing data and you, you verify, did my testing set, have, did the errors go down? And until those residuals on your testing set, are the residuals small enough on your testing set? When those are small enough, then you go ahead and, and implement that. The key thing is that that testing set is never actually used to build the model. And it's kept totally outside only for the purposes of validating the model performance. And ideally, what should happen is you should take your data and this should be your testing set. And this should be your training. Let's say this data is from 2002 to 2005. And this data is from 2006 to 2008. You're going to build your model on that data and then test it on future data. So you're simulating what would have happened if I applied the sensor online. In these two years, you, you look at how the sensor would have performed in the future. It's not appropriate to take your data like this and take this row as training, that row as testing this row as training, that row as testing, etc. Right? Is that, that clear? Because this, the root mean squared error of prediction you get from these testing rows here and this testing row here, you're going to calculate root mean squared error of prediction from those rows, is going to be small. Right? Because these data are similar to the data around them. They were taken roughly at the same time. The process was operating similarly at that point in time. This is going to be a small root mean squared error. It's an over-optimistic estimate of how your soft sensor will perform in the future. This is what you should be doing. So related to that is what's called the test set switch. <coughs> when you split your data in half, and you build your model on part one, test on part two. And that's what I just described over here. So we'll call this root mean squared error of prediction part two. It's then sometimes you get you get a root mean squared error, but you you want maybe a second estimate of that. So you switch the testing and training groups around. Now that may not be quite appropriate, but it's still in line with what you're doing. You're just basically running time backwards. You're now saying, what if I build my model on this region? So you now make this your training and you make this your testing. And this is now called root mean squared error of prediction one. So you're running time backwards <coughs> and you calculate basically two estimates of your root mean squared error of prediction. You, you use the average of these two. Okay. So that's your what's called the test set switch. When you you don't you don't have the luxury of having so much data that you can just keep a test set aside only for testing. You don't have so much data. So what you do is you take the limited data and you do half and half, and switch it around and you calculate the average root mean squared error. And, but the final model you use, you can use it on all the data. But at least you're now going to see how well your model is likely to perform in the future. Unfortunately, software packages do not make this easy for you. They don't automate this in any way. So you'll see in today's class, we actually have to go manually and record these values, do it all ourselves. We're great at the software to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions before we take a look at doing this as an, in an exercise? We're going to do it on the, uh, with, the, with the sawdust data set. <coughs> so okay. essentially, with the test sets, which you're just trying to get an idea of how time affects the specification of the. We want to 
couldn't really see how well it will work in the future for you, which is how you're going to apply yourself to it. Okay, so this data set, uh, take a, uh, if you've got your computers, we can open it. And then I'll just explain the, explain the, the problem, and uh, we'll work on it for, say, 10, 15 minutes, during which time you can also take a break. So what we've got with this data set, the way it was collected is, there's a series of wavelengths. So it's again, it's a near infrared spectrum wavelengths. And there are 54 samples in this data set. So I'd like you to use observations 1 to 30 to build the model. And observations 31 to 54 to test. Now the testing data were applied in a way that was different to the to the, uh, the, the the data to build the model were acquired from a DOE. The testing data were also acquired from a designed experiment, but there was a different design. So they they're not similar data sets. Okay, so it's not like we're going to go do this. But so use those first 30 observations to build the model, use the remaining observations to test. And then I want you to do the test set switch as well. So flip those around. What if I build my model on those observations and then test it on the first 30? I want you to report root mean squared error of prediction for the y variables. Now there's three y variables. One, two, and three. Why one, two, and three are the sawdust from an industrial sawmill was collected for spruce, birch, and pine. So there's three trees species. The sawdust from an industrial mill was collected where they only were sawing birch, <coughs> only were sawing pine, and only were sawing spruce. When they did these experiments, they took those pure sawdust and they mixed it. So let's say the first row was a 0, 0, 100% mixture. The next row might have been a 0, 50, 50 mix. And then it was a 33, 33, 33 mix. So the first 30 rows of different mixtures of those three sawdusts. The remaining rows were also mixtures, but done in different ratios and different in a different experimental design. And then you've got the near infrared spectra that come as a result of those mixtures. Okay. So what we're what we're aiming to do is build a model that can predict y1 and y2 and y3. I want you to report the root mean squared error of prediction on the testing set for each of the three y's. Switch the data around and repeat it the other way around. And then we'll look at calculate the average. Okay. 